Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are back in the book of Exodus, and we are covering chapter 20, which is a continuation from chapter 19. Now, in chapter 19, I just want to highlight a particular, uh, how should we say, a particular verse, which is right here. Um, verse 3 onwards up to verse 6. Just by way of revision, uh, I wanted us to realize that when Moses went up to God, God called him from the mountain, and this would be Mount Horeb or, or Mount Sinai or Sinai. And thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and you know that at this point in time, the house of Jacob would refer to all of them and tell the children of Israel, and both will refer to the same, right? Jacob is Israel, and children of Israel will refer to all 12 tribes at this time, because they just left Egypt. Three months thereafter, they arrived at this mountain, where Moses saw God in, uh, in Exodus chapter 3, uh, at the burning bush, at the same mountain. And God reminded Moses to tell them what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings. Very quickly, swiftly, out of Egypt, but in that three months, God brought you to myself. Actually, God was waiting at this mountain. And Moses' job was to bring them out. And God brought them through the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And now they are here at Mount Sinai. And therefore, if, and always remember, if is a very important word. If is conditional. If you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, and which is what God is going to give here, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. Which means that this particular nation called the house of Jacob and the children of Israel will be a special treasure to me, to God. For all the earth is mine. And what does God want to make them? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And that's what I want to point out to you when we enter into chapter 20. A kingdom of priests would be one that they will always come to draw near to God for sacrifices and atonement, and a holy nation being special. And they will be a special treasure. And how are they a special treasure? Not because God said so, but God in chapter 20 is going to demonstrate to them how they will be different from the rest of the world. As we now plow into chapter 20, we are covering what is commonly known as the Ten Commandments, or some people call it the Ten Statements. And it says this, God spoke all these words saying, and this is God having told Moses, and Moses is now with the people. Moses have gone up, come down, gone up, come down a couple of times, and now revealing to the people. This is what God says. I am the Lord your God. It is a reminder. Who is God? He is the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, the word bondage is about servitude. Meaning, they were working as servants. They had masters, and they had to listen to them. And when the masters were good, everything was fine. When the masters were bad, they had to do heavy and, and, and heavy lifting and, 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 and work, which they were suppressed. And so God is reminding them, this is me. I brought you out with all these miracles. I am the one. And this is the focus. 
and thereby begins the Ten Statements. You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, there will be no other Elohim. Before me is towards my face. But what do you mean is no other gods? Other means behind. This word here is behind. Which means that they are not supposed to have any Elohim after all this is said and done. No other Elohim. Don't care what time it is that in God, the Lord your God has said so, nobody comes after God now. So other is behind. That is what it means, no other gods. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Make is fashion. You know how people would take a piece of wood or a, a, a piece of metal and they carve uh, and mold images out of it. And that is what it means by images. An image is a likeness. And so God says, you're not supposed to do that. No likeness. Uh, the idea here is form, right? Form or representation. Of anything in the sky, on the land, in the water, you shall not bow down. Well, verse 5, when it says bow down, uh, and, and the word is a familiar word, shakach, right? Shakach, meaning lie prostrate, treating them as greater than you. You can only do that to the valid people in, in the customs, right? To a, a, a lord or a king and to the Lord your God, but no other, no other nor serve them. The idea of serving them is to do work for them. That is to do work. So God is saying that I have brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of serving other people. And so when you come out now, I am that God, that Elohim. There shall be no one after this you cannot make yourself any images. You cannot bow down to them. You cannot do work for them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, this is what we need to, 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 to try to understand. The word jealous here in verse 5 is kana. It, it's very much like um, protective. Protective means this. It's even, you can imagine a nest where there are little baby birds and then the mother bird or the father bird is there to protect these little birds from, from, um, from predators, from other people who or other animals may come to take them away. And so God says, you don't do that. I am here. I'm going to be very protective of you because you are going to be my special treasure. Now, just imagine if you had a gold bar, won't you protect it? That's your treasure. And so God treats Israel as his gold bar, his treasure. But his condition is this, that if you don't, he will visit. Visit is pakat. Okay, spelling pakat. Uh, the idea of um, of visit is how should we say to give attention, right? God will put attention uh, to them, uh, but in another sense, it's it's to come to discipline. So the negative sense of visit is that God will come to deal with you. How? Deal with what? The iniquity of the fathers. What is the iniquity of the fathers? Remember, iniquity here is avon. 
being twisted. Meaning you take God and then there are other gods. So the whole passage here is about images, right? About images. If you make all this, God is a jealous God and I will come and deal with you because of what you do of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth. Well, the word generations doesn't show, but imply for those who hate me. Now, you need to understand the word hate is sane. Sane means turning away from God, right? Uh, it, it's like a thorn bush. There is a thorn bush. And what do you do with thorn bush? You don't hug it. You, you turn away. You don't want to touch it. And that's what it means by hate here. That you don't want to have anything to do with God. But this is the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, if that is what you do, I'm going to come to deal with you, even to the third and fourth generation. But I will show mercy, chesed, loving kindness. Loving kindness. To thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So right here and then, Calf images, you don't serve them. You don't bow down to them. Because if you do, number one, the bad things will happen. God is going to come and deal with you generation after generation. But if you keep or love me and keep my commandments, God will say, I will show loving kindness to you. Now understand this, God is not going to punish just because of the fathers, but what the fathers did or will do with regards to idolatry, it will be passed down to the children and the children's children. And if they continue to do that, God will visit them. And that would be a sad case. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, this is important. The word take is to lift up. So it, it's not take like, you know, you, 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 you take something. This is too English, but the word lift up means you display, uh, you portray by the word name, it is character. The character of the Lord your God in vain, worthless. As if it means nothing. And that is what God is saying. Do not display the character of God. When you carry the name of God with you, you are displaying your relationship with God. It is not just about pronouncing God's name. That, that's, that's not the point. God says when you go out and the people of the world see you, they should see me. And so when you lift up my name, it cannot be of no value. That is what God is saying here. For the Lord will not hold him, him guiltless. The idea is, um, how should you say uh, guiltless here is in a will not hold him unpunished. I think that would be a good word, unpunished. If you take his name or you hold up his name, uh, in worthlessness. Okay, so you you get the picture for this one. The next verse is in verse 7. He says, remember the Shabbat to keep it holy. Now, the word keep it holy doesn't mean to protect. So let's break this down. Remember is to bring to mind. Always remember. The, the, word are all, the words in, in the verbs are, are action-oriented. So, should think about it as 
as as, um, as as very visually moving, right? Bring to mind the Sabbath day, and the Sabbath day is a day of rest, okay? And which we we read it in Genesis chapter two. Six days God worked, and the seventh day He rested. He stopped work. He ceased working. And so God says you should keep it holy. The word keep it holy is one word. Basically, to be holy or special. Make it different. So when the Sabbath day or the Shabbat comes, it has to be different from the rest of the day. Why? Because when you say remember, the question is, what are you trying to remember? You should be remembering what God did in six days and rested on this day. That is the remembrance. So you say six days you labor and do your work. And the word work is occupation. Meaning the things you regularly do. All right. Uh, and, and, and this is a very important point. Your occupation your business that you are busy with. But on the seventh day is the rest of the Lord your God. You shall do none of these work. Nobody. You see all these people? Nobody. Even your cattle should stop. They're not supposed to till the ground if they are supposed to till the ground. Not even the stranger who lives among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And that's a reflection of Genesis chapter 1. And he rested the seventh day, Genesis chapter 2. And therefore the Lord blessed the Shabbat and made it holy. And that is what it means to keep it holy, to hallowed it. Same word. And so God wants them to remember. So that when you sit around on the day of rest, it is not to laze around and watch TV and uh, do nothing. Basically, the Bible really tells us that when you are to remember, you are to bring to mind and recollect what God has done. Just like the Passover when the Israelites are supposed to remember. So this is one of those things that happens before this period and is now incorporated into this, what we call the ten commandments verse 12 honor your father and your mother this this is a very interesting phrase you see normally you would think oh oh why 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 is the father and mother um appearing in the 10 commandments and it's a good question to ask. I mean, in any good Bible study, you know, the, all the four W's and one H, you should be asking, why did God say this in the Ten Commandments? For all the relationships in the world, what about your husband and wife, your parents? Why does, do parents come in so importantly featured first? And this is because in the Hebrew understanding of the family unit, the father and mother, is perhaps the most important. So the word honor here is place importance to the father and mother. Honor means weight. Uh, very much like the Chinese uh, understanding, uh, zhong, right? Uh, it, it, it is to kan zhong. To, to, to look at something with weight. And in terms of weight here, it would be weight of importance to the father and mother, which means that they are to be honored. They are to be respected. They are to be listened to because they are the ones who brought you up, gave you life and led you up and help you grow up and that that that's the picture the father and mother in the hebrew context is very important and similarly in old china in conservative ancient china that's exactly the same that your days may be long upon the land which the lord is giving you and that's a promise that you will live long 
right? The next one is you shall not murder. Uh, and that would be kill unjustifiably. Meaning you don't simply go out and kill people. If it's not war, there is no defense. You don't go out and, and well, the word murder is a good modern word. Premeditated that you go out and purposely want to kill someone. And God says, you should not do that. You shall not commit adultery. Now, committing adultery here would be to take another woman. as your own, but she belongs to another, to another man. That's how the Hebrew views adultery. That just like when we read in the book of Genesis, uh, God made it very clear that the Pharaoh is not to touch Sarah. Avimelech is not to touch Sarah. Avimelech is not to touch Rebekah because these women belong to another man. So committing adultery generally is about a married woman. Right? You shall not steal. The word steal here is to take another person's property. by secret. When you take it in front of him, that's robbing, right? When you take it secretly and it doesn't belong to you, that's stealing. And God wants to make clear that whatever belongs to a person needs to be respected. And these are rules, I think, in general humankind. Everybody knows that. You know? Some people say, I don't believe in God until people take their things and, 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 and that cannot be. So do not take another person's property it is very humanly natural. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Bear false witness would be, uh, how, should, how should we say? It would be evidence that, 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 that is false. And with the purpose of hurting. Who is your neighbor? This part here, the word neighbor is your companion. And generally it refers to your own fellow man. Because there is a, there is a common rule. And so when you stand together and you make an accusation, it must be true. Don't bear false witness. Why? Because God is a just God. God is a true God. And so when you lift up his name, when you carry his conduct, then you need to live. And these are the words that is telling us how to live as how God is. The last one is you shall not covet. Covet means uh, take because of desire or lust. That you really want something that doesn't belong to you. And like what? House, neighbor's wife, servants, ox, donkey, or anything that is your fellow man. Now, this is important because eventually in the later part of the Israel history after the split of the kingdom, there is a concept that they have abused called Hamas, which is injustice, taking other people's property by force, by cheating, by all kinds of means. And that is coveting. When the rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer. And this is already enshrined in the Ten Commandments. And that, in a nutshell, is how we, how this people called the treasure of God, a nation of priests, a holy nation, is supposed to live by. 
Are these very difficult? In actual fact, this is a, a, a natural progression. If, if God is their God, this is not much to ask for. It is to live in peace. Don't stir trouble with your fellow men. Respect each other as God respects them. So respecting means don't go and take what is not yours. When respect your family and, and the family unit is very important. You know, China has Confucianism. And China's Confucianism really stems with some of these ideas that came out from the Ten Commandments. The family unit makes up the strength of the society, which then makes up the strength of the country. And in this case, God is telling them, you are my holy nation. I will protect you. Of course, God, God's might and God's power. But within themselves, the family unit revolves around the father and mother. And then in that community and in society of the fellow brethren, do not do anything that hurts another and do not take anything that doesn't belong to you in any which way. And that would be enshrined in the Ten Commandments. When you know God, you will do this for your neighbors. When the later part in life, the Israelites worship idols, they broke all these rules. Why? Because those idols cannot tell them the Ten Commandments. So now all the people witness the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Now, what does this mean? You see, the people saw thunderings, lightnings, trumpet, smoke. They saw it. And they tremble, they shake in their pants, and they stood far away from the mountain, afraid that something will happen to them. So all these are important for us to understand that this is the evidence. This is the evidence uh, that that God wants them to to know, uh, so that they can see, right? They can see. That is important. If they can't see, then they don't know who God is. They didn't hear God speak, but they witnessed. They can now testify and tell their children and the children's children, we stood at the mountain of God and we heard thunder, lightning, trumpet, smoke. Now, all these we understand, right? Thunder, lightning, smoke. What about trumpet? When, when, when air is compressed and pushed out of the ground through little holes in the caves, that, that pressure will build up and come out like a trumpet sound. And so this, this is what happens. And, and, and it's to show the people God is real. And so they tremble and they stood far away. Now. In later passages, always remember chapter 20, verse 18. They actually saw God. As Moses spoke to them, God, God showed his presence, basically. And then they said to Moses, Oh, you go and speak and we will hear, right? You speak to us, we will hear. Don't let God speak to us, lest we die. And that's how they fear God. So next time you read the word fear God, this is how God wants them to know that if you do something wrong, you will die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you. And that's to examine you in verse 20, to try you. Uh, and, and basically is to prove you. Prove what? This is to prove. To prove that when he comes before you, you will fear him and you will not miss 
Okay. What do you mean may you not miss? One of the things we, we, we tend to forget is this. When God tells people what to do, people tend to forget. It's like, you know, when a parent tells the child, hey, pick up all your toys on the floor. And they say, yes, mommy, I picked it up. And, and actually, there were 10 pieces and they only picked up eight. And two was just snuck between the, 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 the sofa. And then you said, son, you haven't finished. Now, that is sin, okay? That is missing. Out of 10 things you have to pick up, you only picked up eight. Now, is it important to listen carefully? Well, as a parent to a, the child, yes. But if we were to enter into the, let's say the palace of the Agong, and the Agong has a protocol, these are 10 things you must do. Do you think we have a choice to say, I'm going to do eight? I think eight is enough. Maybe six is enough. Maybe I'll just add and modify a few of them. The moment we do that, the Bible says that we have chata, sin. God wants to show them, I am real. I'm here to test you. I want to see that you fear me when I come before you so that you will listen carefully right here and do not miss any point that God has told. That is what sin actually means. And so the people stood far off and Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So Moses went further up. That is what happens in verse 20. Okay. Now moving down to verse 22. Now Moses is talking to God because he went up into the smoke and the thick darkness always in the Bible represents the presence of God. Like in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and darkness was upon the surface of the deep. That is the presence of God. And so the thick smoke, the thick darkness was in at the top of Mount Sinai and Moses went all the way up and he kind of disappeared into the presence of God. And so God spoke to Moses and said, this is what you shall say to the children of Israel. So remember this, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Let's unpack this. Seen. They can actually see with their eyes. That God has spoken with you all the sounds and wonders. You are the Israelites. From the skies. Now heaven doesn't mean all the way up into the outer space. In the Hebrew text, sky is Hashemayim. And land is Aretz. That's it. What they can see up when they look up, what they can see down when they look down. And God is up there. So when they look up, although it's on top of the mountain, it is up. Okay? That's also the Hashamayim. Verse 23. You shall not make anything with me. Now, 23 is an interesting phrase. The word with is together. Together with. Make fashion. Right? Just as in verse 3, right? You, you're not supposed to make anything. Now, God says, don't make it together with me. Don't place me in one row that one is Jehovah and the others are there. These are gods of silver, gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. God is warning them. This is important. You shall not. This is a repeat to remind them one more time next when Moses go back down. Now, there is an altar that God says you must make. What is an altar? An altar is called a mitzvah. Right? A mitzvah. 
And an altar is always used as a memorial. An altar is used as a sacrifice, a place of sacrifice, uh, essentially to remember God. And so when they sacrifice, they know that they're giving something to God. They make a sacrifice, uh, an altar of stones, and they will remember and recall. Re re make sure we understand this, right? The altar is to bring to memory. It is not to worship because the altar is not, not a, 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 a representation of God. And altars that God wants them to make on in the land is natural stones where you stack stones together. You shall make for me. And that's what God wants them to do. On, on earth, I want you to make me an altar. And on that altar, you shall sacrifice your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. All of these you must do, which you offer to me, right? Your sheep. Now the word sheep here, uh, would be small animals, right? Uh, small animals, whether sheep or goats. And then your oxen. Your oxen will be cattle. Uh, this, this would be interesting. Your oxen would be uh, bigger animals, uh, and let me just put this. These are the males. And this is the males too. God only wants the males to be offered, right? And in every place where I record my Shem, my name. What do you mean by in every place? In every location. Place is actually a location. And this would be a physical location. The, the, the Hebrew word is makum, right? Makum or makum. Uh, the idea here uh, is very similar to the Arabic word which we have in Malay called makam, uh, which is not grave, right? It is a marker of a location, a tombstone, a marker of a tomb called a makam uh, or a makum in the Hebrew. And in every makom, I will record my name. Now, this, this is an interesting. The word record here doesn't mean to write down. It is to cause to remember. Cause to remember. Yes, the English has just gone away here. Cause to remember my character my name is character right so that when you see this offering you can remember the gracious god the loving god the faithful god and i will come to you and god's presence will be with them in the eventual tabernacle not here yet and god says i will bless you and if you make me an altar of stone. If eventually God wants them to make that, make him an altar that is made of bronze. But if there is an altar of stone, this is the rule. So we are beginning to have rules. Now, let me just say this God's altar, God's rules. I've always said this whenever we deal with God, it is always based on God's rules. God really doesn't care what we think. I I'll be honest with you. When God wants his people to come to him, to serve him, to do what he says, to make offering and sacrifice and whatnot and worship, God wants them to do it on God's terms. God's presence, God's rules. God's altar, then God's way. What is God's way? You shall not build it with hewn stones. This is important. Hewn stones means what? 
cut stones. Right? Cut stones. The word tool here uh, would be cutting tools. Cutting tools. And by cutting tools, this word comes from the word sword or dagger or knife. Something that you cut. Because if you do that, you have profaned it. And these are, these are um, uh, what do you call it? Serious words, right? Profane means defile. Defile. Defile means you violate. You violate the specialness or the holiness. You treat as common. If God is holy, we must deal with these things in a special way. If God, God is not your tetarik chum, right? You know, you just don't say, oh, come, let's hug and I will, I will do what I like. You will see throughout the Old Testament and, and particularly here as we begin, God wants it done in very specific way. If you use your tool cutting, you swing and you chop and you chip and it becomes a hewn stone of an altar, God says, I don't want it. Because you have made it, violated it, you've defiled it, you've treated it as common. The other idols from the Canaanites, the Egyptians, everybody else does this. But you are my special people. When people see that you have altars that is using natural stones, it means that you are my people. Now verse 26 is another rule. Let me use another color. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Now understand this. In the ancient times when people put up an altar, let's say this is an altar, right? And how would people make altars? They would make altars by building steps all right and that's how altars were made so a a priest would be wearing a robe and the robe will expose the underparts of the priest and so your nakedness is exposed you have to take big steps, right, up. And God says, I don't want to see this. So what did God say? God says, I don't want it to be by steps to my altar. Remember, God's altar, God's rules. So let me just show you what. God meant. God says, I don't want steps. I want it this way. And so when you have a priest, he would walk up in small steps. Now, eventually, they changed the robe and required the priest to put on pants or trousers to avoid accidents, right? And in so doing, they would, they would put salt on the, the platform that they walk up. And this is a distinction. So let me put it here, a distinction. If you look at the um, all the, the, the big altars, the moment you see steps, it is not Israel. The moment you see steps, they are all pagan. The Canaanites, the Amorites, uh, and the Ashtoreth, the Milcom, and the Egyptians, everybody. Uh, if you go to 
Mexico, Aztecs, everybody's pyramids, everybody's uh, uh, temples, uh, where they offer sacrifices, they look very different from the Israelites. Why? Because God says, my altar, my rules, and it will be a slope platform. That is God's way. And so later on, there are dimensions, right? There's about 32 cubits to go up a 10 cubit height. So that, that is about 32 cubits. And this is about 10 cubits. And so this slope is gradual. So whenever you look at altars or pictures of altars of the Israelites, you know, whether pictures of tabernacles or, or temples, this is one point that you must all remember, that there are no steps. There is only a slope platform. And with this, we end chapter 20.